Hey everyone, uh, I've taken a few stabs at this video here trying to make it a little bit more concise. Uh, I have a little bit of a cold as well, but I really was intrigued by this reading for a couple of reasons. One, because of when it was written. Two, it being an actual piece of collaborative writing that took a bunch of uh, critique from outside sources. So it's, it's an example of collaborative learning as well. And then also, Three, how it kind of impacts things now and after everything we've read this entire semester, kind of where I place this knowledge with how the world currently is. Um, I wanted to share one thing first of all about there is a, a democratization that occurs um, when we use online resources because, you know, as the article mentions, you can have professors that are looking for, that are writing maybe an academic paper that get outside input from somebody that might really help them rethink things, reconsider, maybe maybe add things or change things. And here, unbeknownst to them, it's a 14-year-old girl from Vermont. Had they known it was a 14-year-old girl from Vermont, maybe her opinion would be discounted because of her age or inexperience, whatever the case is. But on the internet, it forces us to take this knowledge at face value um, and, and make us judge if that information or knowledge is valuable. So we have to make that judgment call. Um, Tom had a great thing about fake news and how we do have to curate and be the judges of what is valuable and what is not on the internet um, because we're not able to pull on our pre-existing you know, um, ageist or racial or gender-based concepts or um, you know, our, our, our biases essentially here. All that's there is maybe an avatar and the knowledge. That's it. Um, I also wanted to share a quick example about, they mentioned Ichabod Crane and how 19th century learning is essentially how a lot of teachers and schools and institutions are still set up. Uh, very quickly, my campus at, at Penn State offers a gaming minor and certificate. This was designed to be an, a holistic minor or certificate. So my philosophy teacher would teach game design, would teach uh, some of the philosophies behind video games uh, and how they're designed. Um, we had computer science teachers doing programming, art and music teachers doing the art and music respectively for video games. This first started out as, as a really wonderful holistic process. I was very impressed that both science and humanities were able to collaborate. And this kind of reminds me of what almost this free-flowing Web 2.0, you know, kind of um, golden age of, of technology and, and learning could look like. Uh, however, the other quote that the, the text uses is, the more collaborative a project, the more we have to think about individual credit, especially in cases where profit is not an issue. Now, in this case, profit was an issue, and within a few years, very quickly, certain egos took over the department and essentially you know, the humanities and, and sort of the engineering side of things, the technology side of things, started having a falling out. Um, and what I'd like to think of that the text doesn't talk about as much is about how human egos so often are at odds with um, sort of all these highfalutin ideas in terms of like what technology can do. You know, all this limitless potential that we have to revolutionize the way we learn is always going to be at odds at, at human egos, people that either stand in the way of progress or people that think um, that, you know, their way is the best way there. So that collaboration, I think, is, is really important because it can we can achieve so much if we collaborate, but it does require us to suspend our egos, um, much like if you, um, you know, growing a thicker skin, like sitting through a creative writing workshop or, you know, you're asking for feedback on your million dollar idea or you're asking your friend if you've got food in your teeth, if someone is able to withstand that criticism, that's where I think we're going to see a lot of future growth with this, especially when we go back to the drawing board on things um, like No Child Left Behind. Even if we acknowledge that it's a bad idea, that I, you know, right now that is a current law, so trying to reverse that is very tough because we as a society have to admit we passed something that doesn't work. This is a bad idea. Let's admit we don't know what we're doing. It's a scary thought. The other thing I thought was, <laughs> I had an interesting idea. I thought, Acad academia is really the first social media that existed, uh, a small group of like-minded individuals uh, that essentially would share ideas back and forth, would collaborate in some regards with papers, with conferences, and just like social media, would troll each other endlessly, like Tesla versus Edison or people calling out, you know, other... Um, uh, uh, what do you call it, physicists, uh, and, and basically, uh, you know, trolling Hawking's or Einstein. 
anyways, that that's sort of the, the nature of it. Now, so we have our own social media, and academia now has almost been labeled like, for most people that participate in social media, academia is something that almost doesn't relate to real life. It's an insular community of people with outdated ideas or an outdated learning method. Um, I think, too, in trying to address how we can basically help evolve schools, what we can do with the institutions of higher learning, and, and how do they deal with these emerging technologies, we really have to contend with, with things like No Child Left Behind, teaching to tests, the rise of private testing groups, the exodus of, of good teachers from public schools, um, you know, students that are forced to learn to test and not learn to their own abilities, their own interests, who are taught not to pursue their curiosities. All that has to change. And I think one of the ways it has to change is telling students that, okay, you know, put down your phone, don't play this game, don't do whatever it is. That's something you do outside of class. That is that is a fun activity. That is, you know, something that you don't do here because here you're here to learn. That's all extraneous stuff. That line has to be broken down. There has to be time like when Pokemon Go was was a huge thing. People, teachers at, at my Penn State campus, everyone was going, teachers, students, staff members were on their lunch breaks walking around campus, talking to each other, helping each other catch Pokemon. It was a legitimate, you know, cultural event that I was I was witnessing. And it was because everyone was pursuing their own their own idea of fun. Some were doing it to get steps in for their pedometers. Some were doing it to catch Pokemon because they grew up playing Pokemon. Other people were doing it because it was a social thing. It was really wonderful. There weren't people that were that were uh, naysaying it. Everyone was on board for that. And again, it, I think it deals with that the human ego there. Um, the other thing too is I think we have to consider teachers just another valuable resource. Because teachers and parents are the original Google. They're the original Wikipedia. It used to be if you didn't have a question, you'd always ask your parents. And I know you can get a, an answer, the clinical answer, quicker through Wikipedia. But there's a lot of times where if I have a question about, again, let's use philosophy. I can look it up. I can read all these articles. Or I can ask a professor who will tilt his head, think for a moment, and then distill that down into a sentence for me which is really great. And depending on the kind of learner, I think that is still a very valuable resource that we can kind of rely upon there. So again, we have to, I would say, accept that the, the human ego is a great limitation there, that th we're not going to know what the future looks like. When the future arrives, it's going to be just as much of a surprise as it would be you know, in the past for us. And also the future is very gradual. As we accept technology, as new generations grow up and embrace video games, and embrace you know um, television as not something to fry your brain, but has legitimate art forms. As these slow changes are made, our society as a whole is going to be ready to accept new ideas about what learning is and how technology can really play a part in it. Uh, thank you guys again. I appreciate you listening to this, and uh, yeah, it's been a wild ride here. Later.